Hey everyone, I am Amy Zellmer from Faces of TBI. Welcome to the 2019 Brain Health Online Summit. I am a TBI survivor from a fall on the ice in 2014, and myself, along with Dr. Jeremy Schmo from Midwest Functional Neurology Center, we saw a need in the brain injury community for more training and education on alternative healthcare methods and modalities for those suffering from the lingering effects of brain injury. So each week during the month of March, you're going to hear from a presenter who will share either their real life experience living with a brain injury or from providers who are working with brain injury patients. And today I am here with Dr. Jeremy Schmo, and he is the owner of Midwest Functional Neurology Center and the co-developer of the Brain Health Online Summit. Over the past decade, he has been studying and teaching functional neurology. He has treated thousands of patients with neurological disorders, such as head injuries, vertigo, movement disorders, neurodegenerative, and developmental disorders. He specializes in working with post-concussion syndrome, which is his passion. He himself has suffered from lingering post-concussion symptoms after whiplash skiing concussions in 2007, 2009 and 2010. And that is the why behind his passion to help others. He has lectured nationally and internationally for the Carrick Institute of Clinical Neuroscience. He lives and practices in Minnesota with his wife, Erin, who is also a chiropractor. So welcome to the summit, Jeremy. We are on the final day. <laughs> so exciting. Yeah, well, at least it's somewhat warmer here in Minnesota today. Yes. Which is great. And we had, um, you know, the not invisible event two days ago. Mm -hmm. and it was negative 20 and we still had about 50 people show up for the event, which was amazing. <laughs> Super amazing. Yeah. So that was, that was awesome. So yeah. So one of the main reasons why I wanted to talk about sleep is because it was a big issue that I had after my injuries and I wanted to dive deeper into it to try and understand it from multiple different levels. So trying to break down, like, what are the biochemical aspects to sleep? Like, what's going on at a cellular level? What's going on neurologically? Like, what areas of the brain are actually, you know, injured when you, when you have issues with sleep? All right? And then also, what's, what can be going on structurally, too? Because structurally, say if you're in pain, pain can affect your brain, pain can prevent you from having restful sleep as well. And then on top of that, you can have psychosocial aspects like, you know, say if you had a court case going on, you're in little litigation, you have, you know, family, work, life struggles, like what does that even do to the brain? And can that cause issues with areas of the brain that you're trying to heal? And what can those stressors do to your gut and the inflammatory levels in your body that could affect your sleep pattern? So it's super complex. I mean, I've, I've gone through a lot of articles, tried to break it down. I'm most definitely not a sleep expert. I'm just going to say that right off the bat. I mean, there's, there are people that are sleep experts that study this information. One of the guys, I read his book, and he researched sleep for like the last 20 years. I believe he was from Stanford and wrote this amazing book on sleep. Uh, see if I can remember the name of it. And let's just say it's super complex. So mm -hmm. it's hard for different providers to understand. A lot of people with brain injury have sleep difficulties. I mean, anywhere between 40 to 60% of patients are going to have some sort of sleep difficulty after TBI. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I first fell, the first uh, three, four weeks, I slept like 14, 15 hours a night. Mm -hmm. And then something changed. And then it was like, I couldn't sleep. And if I did sleep, it wasn't enough. And I'd wake up during my sleep. And it was really frustrating. And when you don't sleep, you don't feel well. So it, it, turns into that vicious cycle right yeah you don't sleep you don't feel well and then commonly i mean people are going to go get different tests for their sleep right I and mean, so people will get sleep studies performed 
people will order those tests. And honestly, like a lot of times it, they'll come back with, there's going to be an absence of findings on these tests. That's due to the complexity of what's going on with traumatic brain injury. So there's multiple different areas of the brain that can be injured, which can make the testing, you know, somewhat difficult to read. Um, so what I'm saying is if these tests come back negative, it, but you still have the subjective feelings that you have these sleep difficulties, in the research it says that you need to take that into account what the patient is feeling. So your perceived amount of sleep and your restfulness and how you feel can affect how, how you, you know, have anxiety and depression and your social integration, which is super important. And one of the things is with, you know, more mild traumatic brain injury, there's more sleep difficulties in the research in patients with mild TBI compared to severe TBI. And why is that? Well, maybe the patients with severe TBI aren't able to let you know that they have these sleep mm -hmm. difficulties. But a lot of times in severe TBI, there are like focal injuries to areas of the brain. With mild TBI, there's more of like a diffuse injury to the brain and it's how these different neurological hubs talk and communicate with other hubs and build these networks. So when you have this diffuse brain issue, it might not show up on the testing when you do, when you do different sleep studies and, and things like that. And it's interesting that patients with more mild traumatic brain injury perceive these sleep difficulties. And another thing is that there's a lot of pressure for you to get back into doing the things that you need to do, like school and work and job and Mm -hmm. All those things, if you have more of a mild injury that you can't see, if it's invisible, right? So people can't see it. You're not bandaged up. You look normal. Therefore, hey, you need to get back into these activities and just get back to your normal sleep cycle, and there you go. But inside, there are changes that are occurring at, from a biochemical aspect, a cellular aspect, a neuronal hub aspect, a neur neuronal circuitry aspect, and how these areas connect together. And then you loop on top of that inflammation, these microglial responses, gut issues that are, are occurring, and then all the psychosocial aspects of, hey, you need to get back to work. You need to do these things. You need to start working out. You need to do these activities. So for me, when I tried to get back into working out, I couldn't sleep for like two, three days. I mean, I, I had insomnia. And obviously there's areas of the brain that were dysfunctional. And that's a big time problem that I see with patients is when they try and get back into more activities and more physical activities, mm -hmm. they get overstimulated. And then they just go down into the dumps for a week. And the yep. whole week when the recovery is gone, and then you have to try and get back into that. So we're, we're trying to develop different strategies right now based off of what we think are going on with people's sleep cycles, whether it's a circadian rhythm issue, whether it's insomnia, whether it's hypersomnia. There's different types of issues that can develop with your sleep pattern, and that's why things get so complex. You know, talking about that overstimulation, I remember, I mean, if I went to the mall, if I went to an event, like a conference, conferences were the worst because yeah. you're dealing, you're listening to a speaker and then you're talking to people and there's all sorts of people and noise. I could not sleep. I would lay there for like hours and my mind would just be like whizzing around um that overstimulation was really hard for me to wind down from at night yeah what um what kind of strategies would you use to to help you with that to calm mm -hmm. your system yeah none, none? <laughs> yeah i mean you know my my strategy was i know i'm not i'm going to need a couple days to recover from that mm -hmm. so that was my strategy. It didn't help me sleep, but it helped me have those two days afterwards to recover. Yeah. 
So here's the thing. I mean, 50% of people with, with mild TBI are going to have some form of a sleep disorder. All right. And that could be insomnia. That could be sleep apnea. It could be narcolepsy. You can even develop like periodic limb movement disorder. So there are sleep difficulties that are more prevalent in traumatic brain injury population than your general population. And I, Which I, mean, make- <laughs> I think 40 to 60 is low, but yeah. I mean, almost everybody I've met with a brain injury has had some type of sleep problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which should, you, which should make you feel like you know you're not you're not alone. You're not alone, that's <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, with these sleep issues, there there are issues that are going on at the cellular level, at the at the neuron, and then inflammatory responses, sodium potassium pumps, NMDA receptors, things that are going on that are keeping these neurons from being as stable as they need to be. So just the frequency of firing of neurons and traumatic brain injury can be hyper excitable, which we need to take into account. And there are different things that you can do to get your neurons to be more stable. Do you you know anything that you could possibly do? To make your neurons more stable? Yeah. No. (laughs) Fatty acids, so Mm. DHA, all right. Just Omega threes, that kind of thing. Staying hydrated. Mm, yes. Hydra- hydration can be very, very important. All right. Magnesium, magnesium threonate. We use something called Optimag Neuro from Zymogen. Love you that stuff. Plug up these receptors at the cellular level to lead it to be more stable. All right. So when neurons are stable, there's a lot of stuff that's going on at the cellular level. And there's oxidative stress, there's free radicals. These neurons that are unstable are now communicating with other neurons and making them unstable. And then these, basically these hubs start to fire, you know, at a frequency of firing that they just can't handle, all right, which is is very important. So there are things that you can do from a nutritional standpoint, in my mind, to try and make your neurons more stable, which could potentially help with sleep. And you stated that your sleep has been better with doing CBD oil. Mm -hmm. All right. So that would be something that potentially is improving the inflammatory barrage of what's going on at the cellular level. And sleep is so important because it helps you clear neurotoxins and debris from the brain during the day. Did you know that? Mm -mm. So your brain has what's called a glymphatic system that helps you clear this debris. And when you clear this debris, it allows you to be able to uh, heal up your your axons. You have something called a oligodendrocyte, progenerator cells, that when you clear this debris, these cells can function at a higher level to help you build myelin to help heal damaged tissue in the brain, which is really cool. (laughs) So, Sleep is very important for clearing this neurotoxic debris from the brain, all right, which is something to take into account. And I can't remember which side. There's, there's a certain side of your body that you're supposed to lay on. Oh, I always forget if it's left or right. <laughs> no, we'll let, we'll let people know that, but it can I help. I think it's left. I think you're supposed to lay on the side of your heart. I don't remember. I don't know why I'm forgetting that one, but somebody, <laughs> somebody will message in and go, it's the left or it's the right. We'll, we'll figure it out. So at the cellular level, there are things occurring in the brain that sleep is very important and it allows you to be able to clear debris in the appropriate way to help you build uh, oligodendrocyte progenerator cells to help you build myelin to rebuild axons and tissue that was damaged in the brain. It's left. Left. I Googled it quick. (laughs) There you go. So, you know, with sleep, there's something called sleep architecture. Did you know that? Mm -mm. (laughs) Mm-mm. All right. So sleep is broken down into slow wave sleep and paradoxical sleep. In the slow wave sleep, there's four different stages. All right. And that slow wave sleep 
you're having what's called non-rapid eye movement sleep. In the paradoxical stage, you're having rapid eye movement sleep, and 80% of the time, you're in that rapid eye movement sleep stage. Any of these stages can get affected with traumatic brain injury, and that's why you know, the whole sleep pattern stuff is so complex. So, you know, we talked about what's going on at, at like the cellular level. There can be issues that are going on at a network scale level. So a network scale level, there's different areas of the brain, like neurological hubs, that are part of this bigger, wider network. And in traumatic brain injury, there's a network, it's called default mode network, that gets disrupted. And default mode network is very important for getting your brain to calm down and get into this relaxed mode so you can sleep. Default mode, default mode network gives you a sense of yourself, you know, your inner self and who you are. And it's hard to get into that mode in our lifestyle because we're always in executive network mode and our brains are always going, 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 going. You know, we're on the computer, you know, we have to answer to emails, we have to do all these different things. It's hard to get into this default mode network. And, you know, during our program that we do, we have different strategies that we use to try and get people into default mode. Like we'll have people like, take a stethoscope, like listen to their own heart, like listen to their own, you know, inner heart sounds, their bowel sounds, their own vasculature. And then we'll have them work on deep breathing and positive thinking and, and meditation while we're doing like non-invasive cranial cold laser over the vagus nerve and on the gut. And then we do some other things where we'll pump your legs with, it's called the Normatec device, where we'll basically pump lymphatic flow and blood flow and you start feeling the blood you know the vessels in your legs and this can help activate these default mode networks in the brain and we do different things like tilting you on a tilt table to help you perceive gravitational load while we're doing these activities so we've developed different strategies in our mind that might help get you into this default mode and we'll work you in going default mode executive network mode Sometimes we got to amp it up. We got to work your memory, your frontal lobe, your dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. We got to get things activated. And then you're activated. And then we got to teach you how to calm back down to get back into that mode. So we'll like oscillate people and show you those strategies to do at home to help basically get these networks to function better. And at like a network scale level, there's a, there's a disconnection that's occurring in the brain just because of the areas of the brain that get injured and you actually develop a hyper connectivity between areas of the brain that might not, they, they shouldn't be as connected as they are. And you develop this over facilitation and over firing of different regions of the brain. And then on top of it, you can injure other areas of the brain that are inhibitory. So if you lose inhibition, you're gonna have over facilitation of these pathways that are firing too much. And then you start developing neuronal networks that start communicating in aberrant ways, which can make your brain super confused about what's going on. And then things start firing too much. And then there you go, your brain's gonna feel like it's whipping around, thoughts are going all over the place, they're not connected in the right way. So that's what's going on from a neurological level a network level and a cellular level, and then you put that all together, and that's kind of a, a disaster for the different areas of the brain that are involved with sleep. And on top of this, you can, you can just injure different areas of the brain, like the suprachiasmatic nucleus and how it talks to the hypothalamus. Those areas regulate your melatonin circadian rhythm. So when you wake up in the morning, like you're cortisol level should go up and your melatonin should be down and these are inverse and throughout the day basically your cortisol level should go down your melatonin level should go up when you're about to fall asleep and melatonin doesn't specifically make you fall asleep melatonin is involved in basically activating all those areas of the brain the networks 
to get you into these sleep modes to allow you to be able to fall asleep. So just, just taking melatonin. That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> like, it could be helpful in some cases. In some cases, it might not do anything if it's more of a brain network inflammatory underlying mechanism. But in my mind, it would be worth a shot. I mean, if you can't sleep, I mean, I would try that. If right. You- I try that. I tried that yeah. early on and I tried, I forget the max dose you're, that you're technically supposed to take. Mm-hmm. And it, it, and you're supposed to like take it for a, like a month or more to see, bef- mm-hmm. you know, if it works and it yeah. didn't do anything for me. So, you know, what I was saying, you, you can have, you know, cellular biochemical metabolic issues that are going on with the brain that can affect sleep, neurological hubs, neurological areas that connect to each other, psychosocial factors. And then on top of it, you know, you add in these areas of the brain that integrate these different rhythms, which can be affected. And that makes things really, really complex. All right. Um, one of the next things I was going to talk about is structurally. Imagine if you're just in pain. Mm. You know, you like your neck hurts, like you got injuries to different areas. You know, your neck is whiplashed. You try like rolling over in bed and it hurts. Like that can lead to, to you have, you know, not having restful sleep. Yeah, right. that makes total sense. Right, so you could have just these structural injury components. But again, structural changes physically and pain can affect these different networks in the brain. So pain can cause changes in these networks. So pain could affect your default mode network and your inability to get into that default mode. So you can't really just break the brain apart, the body, and like everything's fully integrated together. So in one person's case, you might have to try and decrease their pain, get their neck to calm down, and then you go, well, crap, their neck's tight because there's something going on with their eye movements and their balance in their vestibular system, and we need to get that under control to get their neck under control. You get that under control, they might fall asleep like that. We've had people like during our week, that have not been able to sleep and within two days in our program, they're like, that was the most restful sleep I've had in 10 years. <laughs> That's awesome. Because we're, we're activating these areas of the brain, we're getting them out of pain, we're teaching them how to oscillate between executive mode and default mode network, and boom, there you go. And we didn't do anything met, you know, metabolically, nutritionally in those two days, which is cool. And of course, we're gonna have them do something when they get home and we're trying to develop different just sleep rehab protocols and sleep hygiene to help with this. On top of that, there's, there's online cognitive behavioral programs that you can do, which is, which is important. So in the research, like cognitive behavioral therapy and sleep hygiene techniques and sleep diaries is where it's at for trying to get this under control. And for us, just knowing that you have a sleep issue and 50% of the other people that have Traumatic brain injury, have sleep issues, should make you feel better that, you know, you're not alone with having this. So there's definitely things that we can, that we can do from a rehab standpoint. And in my mind, you want to try and, try and recalibrate these areas of the brain that are, that are injured in the first place. Another thing interesting, um, sleep disordered breathing was found in almost all whiplash patients in one of the studies that I found. That is interesting. Yeah. Uh, and what does that mean? But so breathe, when, you, when you whiplash your neck, you're probably changing integration that's going on here, but also into the upper cervical cord and into different networks into the brainstem where there's, there's different uh, respiratory nuclei that are located in the brainstem. So there, you can actually have a higher cervical cord lesion that can disrupt your breathing that could affect your, you know, how you feel the next day, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So just from a structural standpoint, injury to the neck could cause you to have changes in your breathing patterns, which 
could change your oxygenation level when you're sleeping. Therefore, you wake up the next day not feeling rested because your oxygen was tanked. So there's different differential diagnoses that you have to go through with sleep to try and figure it out. You know, is it structural? Is it an upper motor neuron lesion? Like, did you actually, do you have a cord lesion that's going on at a higher level? So maybe doing some imaging could be important in some cases, but doing a physical exam would be very important. So if you had a higher cord lesion, and there's areas in the cord that when you get these issues, your legs are actually going to be affected first with the way that you move. So you might have changes in like your steppage of your gait. You might actually have bowel and bladder changes. So due to what's going on at the cord, when there's compression and things that are going on, the, the laminar distribution of like your motor system, your lower extremity is actually going to get affected first. So if you had bowel and bladder changes, your legs are just like not doing what they need to do. You have hyperreflexia when you hit reflexes in the lower extremity. And then there's a reflex that not too many people know about. It's called the scapulohumeral reflex. You go and you hit it and you see their shoulders pop up. It's called the, it's called the shimizu, shimizu shimizu reflex. They're, these are the guys that found it. You might start thinking as a practitioner, man, maybe this person has like an upper cord lesion and there's something that's going on at the cord level that could be affecting feedback into the brainstem into these respiratory nuclei that are leading to almost like a central based sleep apnea and changes in oxygenation that will lead to them feeling fatigued the next day. There's just so much neck trauma that can yeah. occur with TBI and whiplash. So when I read that, I was like, Holy smokes. <laughs> and, you know, I, unfortunately, I think whiplash is so, like, underplayed, too, you know, by, by you know, ER doctors, medical doctors. It's so underplayed. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, it just has to heal. And, yeah. you know, I mean, you saw that with me. I was two and a half years out, and mine hadn't healed, at, I mean, hardly at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, structurally, that could be going on. But neurologically... So there are areas of the brain that, are in, that could be injured that basically help drive your brain. So to break it down for people that haven't watched my first talk, gravitational load fires your muscle that gives feedback into your system. It activates your cerebellum that fires into the brainstem, into the upper brainstem. Your upper brainstem fires through the thalamocortical loops to help drive activity in your brain. So therefore, structure and gravitational load are actually pretty important for firing central, structure, central structures. You could injure your pons, your midbrain, your thalamus, with traumatic brain injury. And these are areas that could affect basically your sleep patterns. You could develop hypersomnia. Super fatigue, hypersomnia, where you're just sleeping way too much. Mm. Have you heard of anybody that, that has had those issues? Because I've seen patients with them. They're like, I sleep 18 hours a day. <laughs> yeah. Like, what's going that, on? That was me in the very beginning. Um, but then that went away and went the other way. <laughs> yeah. So with this like coup, counter coup, injury, you know, you could have areas here that get injured. So you could injure your, you know, your temporal regions of the brain. Uh, there's an area called the basal forebrain that's all about sleep initiation, which could be affected. And then you loop back, you hit different areas back here. There's all these bony structures that are going on, and you could actually injure the hypothalamus, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is involved in melatonin homeostasis, you know, things like that, which, which gets really interesting. There's a, there's a tent it's called the tentorium cerebelli that sits above your cerebellum that basically you have the upper part of your brain supratentorial and infratentorial that keeps these lower areas of the brain away from these upper areas of the brain. So basically the pressure going down doesn't cause these to go down into your frame and magnum. And they found that there was actually changes in the tentorial length of patients with mild traumatic brain injury that had sleep disorders, which is interesting. So like this tentorium, this like dural structure, 
the length of it was actually was actually changed in patients that had underlying um, sleep wake disturbances, which is very very interesting. So, you know, there is a lot of complex stuff that's going on. You know, on top of it, there's all these inflammatory responses that are going on. So, in all those areas of the brain that I just talked about, there's inflammation that can be priming up these areas of the brain in different patterns of like glial cell or microglial activation that could be occurring in say like the thalamus or other areas of the brain. Um, there's also genetic changes that can occur as well. So these different genes can get turned on in different ways or not wow. get turned on. So Genetically, there can be changes that are, that are affected with brain injury that affect your brain, uh, BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, uh, FOS, these different proteins can be affected in its ability to help you build neuroplasticity when you, when you hit your head, which can affect sleep-wake sleep cycle. And there's even different genes called like clock genes, like clock three, and these different genes can get turned on in different ways. So on top of the cellular neuronal hub, neuronal network, structural, metabolic, genetic, there's genetic components that could be occurring as well. Like what if you already had insomnia before you hit your head mm -hmm. or people in your family had this and now some of these genetics get turned on, that could be a co component as well. And then on top of that, the whole psychosocial factors that might be occurring. So there's different testing that people do. You know, they have different sleep studies, sleep latency testing, um, actigraphy that put different like objects on you to help monitor like your movements throughout the day to see like, you know, how much you're up and active. Um, different sleep scales that are used in, in the medical world. So one's called the Epworth. You have the Pittsburgh uh, sleep scale. You have ins insomnia scales. You have sleep diaries. I think maybe like a sleep diary could be a really, really good idea. But I think clinically, if you did like the Pittsburgh or the Epworth and actually started documenting your patient's sleep patterns, it could be a good thing to document that. Because here's the thing. I mean, if your sleep is off, your brain's not going to heal. Mm -hmm. If your sleep is off if, and, you, and you develop sleep apnea, central sleep apnea, and your oxygenation is down, your brain's not going to heal. And that's going to lead to more anxiety and stress, and you're just not going to feel good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so there, there's different differentials that you have to take into account with sleep. So one of them could be pain, sleep apnea. You could have central sleep apnea. You could have a circadian rhythm issue where, like, even, like, your temperatures are fluctuate throughout the day. Cortisol circadian rhythm, melatonin, melatonin rhythms can fluctuate throughout the day. And 36% of patients that were diagnosed with insomnia actually had a sleep-wake cycle disorder. So it was a circadian rhythm dysfunction instead of insomnia. And insomnia in the medical world, I mean, people are prescribing different medications to help you sleep. Right. right. Benzodiazepines and, and different things where if it was a circadian rhythm issue, then you would loop back and go, well, what areas of the brain are involved with these circadian rhythms? Maybe we could start doing some blue light therapy. This blue light therapy, get some activation, you know, into these areas of the brain to help flip these cycles around. Maybe there's something nutritionally that you could do. Um, neurotransmitters get off like serotonin and dopamine and these have feedback loops into the suprachiasmatic nucleus which affects melatonin so maybe instead of just taking melatonin you did some sort of precursors that would help with serotonin and dopamine to loop back around and get those nuclei the suprachiasmatic nucleus to function better and how it communicates with the hypothalamus and goes down and talks to your adrenal glands. So your adrenal glands are just end organs of something centrally that's going on. And a lot of patients that I see will be doing like adrenal glandulars, you know, adrenal adaptogens, all these uh, different types of supplements to help with the end organ. 
but maybe you need to go back and look at what's going on from like a neuroinflammatory standpoint and how that could be affecting the brain. So there are different things that you can do to decrease brain-based inflammatory responses. Maybe like curcumin or resveratrol, um, you know, ginkgo. There's, there's different things that you can do nutritionally that might potentially help to calm down a glial response that's occurring centrally in the brain. And then you start activating all these different networks to basically get the, get the networks to start communicating better. Because if the networks communicate better, then your autonomics are going to be more steady. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if the, if the brain is firing to the brainstem and the brainstem is now able to communicate to your gut and you start rebuilding your gut barrier and getting perfusion to your gut, you're going to get better perfusion up to your brain and oxygenation to help your brain heal and decrease this inflammatory response that loops around, gets all these circuits to start firing better and flips your cortisol or your circadian rhythms back around on top of that, then you add in sleep hygiene, exercise, and different light therapies and functional neurological rehabilitation of the networks that were off in the first place. So are there any sleep hygiene um, or any home things that people can do uh, to try to help their sleep cycle? Blue light therapy in the morning. Mm -hmm. So like blue light therapy in the morning and that would be, that's like a, like a box light, right? Box, yeah. Yeah, that short, that short wavelength blue light was actually, I read like a 20-page paper on it about a month ago. And it can actually help build and get better perfusion and blood flow to these areas of the brain. And they were seeing changes on DTI, like diffusion uh, tensor imaging where these tracks, like these tractography tracks, were getting better communication between the corpus callosum, the thalamus, and the areas of the brain that are dysfunctional. Just underlying this stuff, there's, there's changes that are occurring in the brain. So that's very important. Um, the time of day that you like eat, like keeping your blood sugar stable, is, I think is very, very important. You know, not eating foods that are inflammatory for your system can be very important, you know, staying away from, you know, bright lights at night and trying to get, you know, trying to develop some sort of cycle that, that can help flip things around. I know it's super hard, mm -hmm. but, you know, just staying very, very consistent with when you wake up and when you go to sleep. And that's something that um, my patient from Australia who's on the summit, Todd, talked about, and he had all sorts of strategies that he utilized to try and flip his sleep wake cycle around, which became very dysfunctional. And so, you know, you talk about the blue light in the morning mm -hmm. and now is that, so um, I believe on one of our past summits, someone talked about eliminating blue light in the evening before you go to bed and by um, they wore blue blocker um, yeah, to, glasses. To the light out yeah mm -hmm. for the last like two hours of the evening before bed yeah which which could be very helpful mm -hmm. yeah so you know staying away from scrolling on the computer i mean if you have areas of the brain that are injured like your vestibular and the connections with ocular motor nuclei and you have eye tracking issues and you know issues with your optic kinetic reflexes and scrolling and fast movements why would you do that at 10 o'clock at night when you're laying there not moving and getting that bright light yeah. and just feeding into these areas of the brain that are dysfunctional, which are going to lead to more, more stress responses. Exactly. You know, so it's things like that and like trying to figure out, you know, what time of the day, like exercising for you is the best where it doesn't crank your system up to the point where you can't sleep. You know, simple things like hydration and staying away from caffeinated beverage, you know, too late or, you know, different times of the day. It's, you know, it's kind of trial and error <laughs> in a lot of people's cases because everybody's so different. Yeah. So, so yeah, but like what, what happens is like this light coming in can actually 
So light hits your retinal ganglion cells, like in your eye, in the back of your eye, and that feedback, like that goes directly into your hypothalamus, like into areas of the brain that are involved with these rhythms. Which, which how cool is that? So like with, yeah. our, with our therapy during the day, you know, we might be giving people light stimulation at the beginning of the day to like get their system going, and then later in the day go into doing more of our default, default mode network rehab and we'll have basically we'll take away all the light we'll be massaging their eyes with these things that we have from china which are really cool shining vagus nerve stimulation on here and here while we're pumping their legs while they're listening to their own heart rate or we're doing some sort of music frequencies to try and you know build these oscillations between left and right side of the brain while we're stimming their tongue to fire into the brain stem into some of the circuits that are dysfunctional but some people are totally backwards. Some people, you have to do that in the morning. Yeah. They kind of calm their system down before you can jump in and you do rehab. So everybody, I can just say that everybody's so different, <laughs> which, which makes it hard, but we get a pretty good idea. If we hang out with you for a week, we get a pretty good idea of what's going on with you in that aspect, which, which is pretty amazing because then we can give you different strategies based off time of the day for different rehabilitation that you can do because maybe doing your complex movements or your you know vision or vestibular at one time of the day might not do anything compared to if you did it at this time of the yeah. day and we can figure that out during the week when we work with you so well you know the sleep stuff i think is so important it it comes up every day in my Facebook group. So mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you were able to top, tackle this complex, complicated yeah. topic. <laughs> so thank yeah, you. And, <laughs> and, I, you know, and I'm just gonna keep diving into more and more because I really feel like it's, it's that, it's so important mm -hmm. for trying to break through and heal people. You know, you, you can make, make people feel good for a week or two weeks, but trying to flip all the underlying issues that are occurring over the next three months, six months, and a year, we have to give you these strategies to be able to do at home to help you recover. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Jeremy. And yep. thank you for yet another awesome summit this year. Yes. Um, so if, much fun. <laughs> yeah. And anyone who's watching, if you've missed any of the, the presentations this month, you can still purchase them all with the proceeds going to Love Your Brain Foundation. And I hope that everyone has enjoyed this year's summit as much as we have. It's just been fantastic. And thank you all for watching.